of Equinox. Fifty-five million years ago, this high, cold desert in Wyoming was very different. It was a lush and humid forest, much like the Amazon is today. A time when the earth was six degrees hotter than now. There were no ice caps at the North and South Poles, and trees grew in Antarctica. Then there was a sudden catastrophic change. Global temperatures soared eight degrees higher still, and the Earth's climate went wild. Everywhere life struggled to survive. Today, scientists are racing to understand this unique event in Earth history. They have discovered extraordinary effects on life. Early horses suddenly shrank to the size of a modern domestic cat. We see all the mammals here start out at their normal size, and then many of them shrink down to about 80% what they used to be. Well, you can clearly see that uh, climate has changed quickly and dramatically. But the most shocking discovery is that the events that triggered this global catastrophe could soon happen again. Once more, forests could turn to deserts and ice disappear from the poles. The fear is that as today's climate changes, we could unleash the same awesome natural forces that brought havoc to the globe 55 million years ago. And this is not a nightmare for the far-off future. It could happen within our lifetime. Every living thing on Earth is made from thin air. As plants grow, they extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and use it to build tissue. When they die, that CO2 is returned to the air. But millions of years ago, when the world was much warmer than it is today, Vast swamps covered much of the land. Dead plant material accumulated here, slowly turning to coal and other fossil fuels. As it did so, vast quantities of carbon were taken out of the atmosphere and the earth slowly cooled. But today, mankind is conducting a vast experiment with the climate. When we extract fossil fuels and burn them, we force our planet to travel back in time, releasing carbon dioxide that last saw the light of day millions of years ago. We still do not know exactly what the consequences will be. What is known is that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere acts like a thermal blanket, insulating the Earth from the cold of space. If CO2 levels rise, that blanket is thickened and the world warms. Across the globe, powerful computers are running day and night. Inside them, complex simulations of the atmosphere. Leading climate scientists like Peter Cox use these models to try to work out what will happen over the next century. 
We developed models really based on weather forecast models and what we tried to do is to work out how carbon dioxide increase will affect climate through the greenhouse effect. All of the models, and there are lots of models around, suggest a warming and somewhere between two and six degrees Celsius by the end of this century, depending on how fast we emit fossil fuels. But today, it's becoming increasingly clear that scientists have left something out of their calculations, something that could overturn all the forecasts with which we've become so familiar. I think there is something important missing from these models at the moment. And there's a clue to this in something called the missing carbon sink. And that's related to the fact that we know very well how much carbon dioxide is being emitted from industrial activities. But when we measure atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations, they're only going up half as fast as those emissions would imply. Each year, we pour around 6 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Yet the measured level of CO2 is rising by only 3 billion tonnes. So half of our emissions are going somewhere else. Presumably some stores of carbon are being built up in the natural world at the moment, but we're not sure where. In their predictions, scientists have taken these natural stores of carbon for granted. But if the mysterious missing sink were somehow to stop absorbing carbon, it could dramatically affect the course of climate change. There's an assumption that about half of our emissions will still remain in the atmosphere in the future. But I think that's probably an error. And if it is an error, then it could have a significant impact on what we predict for the future, for the next hundred years, in fact. Until climate researchers know how the missing sink will behave over the next century, they can't be confident that their predictions are right. But where on earth is the missing sink? The Amazon Basin, the biggest rainforest on Earth. Vast tracts have remained unchanged for thousands of years. At least that's what scientists believed until a remarkable experiment in the middle of millions of hectares of undisturbed jungle. It has shown that something extraordinary is happening in the forest. Antonio Nobre is a biologist with Brazil's renowned Institute for the Study of the Amazon. It's an amazing thought to think that all this material, this heavy, dense wood, leaf, everything around us is made of thin air. Because all plants use carbon dioxide to make their tissue, the forest represents a vast store of carbon taken from the atmosphere. Nevertheless, scientists were sure it could not be the missing sink. The reason is that in a mature forest, growth is balanced by decay. Termites and fungi eat this material and they breathe like us. So they convert this material back into carbon dioxide and breathe it away. And because this forest is a mature forest, it's not growing actually, so everything that is taken in the building up of the forest is released through this decay process. And it should be in balance, that at least what the ecologists believed, and I, I believed in that for a long time, that this is a mature old growth forest, it's in balance. Whatever it takes, it gives. But then we start measuring it and with the towers, and we found that that's quite not the story. Antonio's tower allows him to study a large area of forest without disturbing it in any way. As you can see, this is really a small footprint tower and it had to be constructed through the canopy without, you know, breaking a twig. It's really here as if the forest was not sensing it, not feeling it, its presence, so to speak. So it, we are sneaking around here and measuring and the forest is ignorant of our presence, so that's the point. His technique is to continuously monitor the flow of air 
in and out of the forest canopy. So whatever carbon dioxide is taken by the trees, we can measure here. There is a sonic anemometer and a, an infrared gas analyzer working together. And then as the gas moves into the forest, we measure, and as it moves out, we measure, and then we make the calculations. And then we know whether the forest is a sink for carbon dioxide, or, or it, it, it's stable, or it's releasing. And what we found, amazingly, is that this forest is indeed taking much more carbon dioxide than actually giving out. That a mature rainforest like the Amazon should be acting as a sink of carbon dioxide is a huge surprise to scientists. What is even more astonishing is the speed at which it appears to be doing so. And what we have been measuring are numbers, really high numbers. Uh, just to give you some figures, uh, for the last year we measured an average five tons of carbon per hectare per year, which is five tons, about 6,000 liters of petrol in your car tank, right? It's a lot of carbon. And that is really impressive. It's not only the carbon, we are resolving the problem of the carbon sink, the missing sink for carbon in the atmosphere. We are showing that this forest is growing as fast as a eucalyptus forest, you know, a new forest or agriculture. And this is amazing. We, we didn't expect that. This astonishing growth rate has to be a recent phenomenon. It cannot have been going on for more than a few decades or the forest would already have reached its maximum size and density. Antonio believes that the growth is in fact a recent response to human activity. We are actually fertilizing the trees with carbon. It's a gaseous fertilizer. It's a strange concept, but it's not so far-fetched because carbon dioxide is their raw material. If they have more, they take advantage of that. You know? So what we believe is that this growth we are measuring here is human-induced. Um, has to do with global warming and greenhouse effect. There are something like 500 million hectares of forest in the Amazon basin. If Antonio's figures are typical of the whole region, the Amazon could be soaking up as much as three quarters of all the carbon dioxide produced by all the motor cars in the entire world. But how long can this continue? It's hard to predict what this is leading to. Uh, we would probably have to look more carefully into the geological record and see other disturbances similar to the one we are producing now, if they happened naturally, what the biota, what the forests did at that time. As the Amazon absorbs CO2, it is protecting us from the full effects of our own emissions. But in the process, it is gradually building up a vast store of carbon. Could this carbon one day pose a threat? In search of the answer, scientists have journeyed into the distant past, where they have found disturbing evidence that natural stores of carbon can suddenly be released into the atmosphere throwing the Earth's climate into turmoil. This is the summit of the Greenland ice cap. The ice here contains a frozen record of the planet's changing climate. As they drill into the polar ice caps, Scientists travel back in time, returning to the surface ice formed from snowflakes that fell hundreds of thousands of years ago. Much of that ancient ice ends up here in Denver, Colorado. This is the National Ice Core Laboratory. Basically, it's a very large freezer where we archive all of the US ice. Uh, this room is our exam room. It is held at about minus 24 centigrade. This is where we do all of our work. 
it's a warmer room than the other. Uh, we cut ice, we do visual stratigraphy. This particular room is our main storage. This is where we archive the ice. This room is held at about minus 36 C. These ice cores were drilled by the Russians at their Vostok research station in the heart of Antarctica. They can take scientists back more than 400,000 years. These are, are precious pieces of ice that people have really struggled to get. So you want to get as much out of an ice core as you possibly can. For climate scientists like Jim White, the most valuable thing to come out of the ice is a record of the Earth's atmosphere as it was in the distant past. The deeper the ice comes from, the older it is. Trapped within it are air bubbles, tiny samples of the atmosphere preserved from the time the ice formed. The trapping mechanism for bubbles is actually very simple. I mean, I, most everyone recognizes that when snow falls, it's quite fluffy, it's full of air. Uh, and imagine this snow uh, on the surface, it's probably 90% air. As it accumulates and piles up and packs down, the air slowly gets squeezed out. There's some point at which the snow is so compacted that it becomes ice. At that point, uh, there's no longer a direct channel of air to the surface. The bubbles become sealed off unto themselves and you have basically a trapped piece of the atmosphere that is going to be there until some ice core scientist comes along and drills it and takes it out. But the cores are doubly valuable because they also contain a record of temperature. By examining the composition of the ice crystals themselves, scientists can work out how cold the air above Antarctica was when the snow fell. The temperature record reveals a history of repeated ice ages as the earth has warmed and cooled in a hundred thousand year cycle. Transferring this information onto a graph reveals the detailed story of these climatic swings. This graph takes us from 400,000 years ago to the present day at zero. When the line is at its highest, the climate on Earth was similar to what we know today. When the line is falling, the Earth was sliding into an ice age. Well, the big picture you can see here on the screen, and you can see here the climate system of the last 400,000 years has uh, these warm interglacial periods, and then they tend to slowly drop down, oscillate into the, into the coldest of the glacial periods, and then uh, fairly rapidly bounce up to these interglacial periods again. And this glacial interglacial cycle lasts about 100,000 years with some 40,000 and 20,000 year oscillations going on in the middle. What lies behind these huge swings in temperature? When the level of the greenhouse gases carbon dioxide and methane are plotted alongside temperature, the answer becomes obvious. The similarity in the curves is truly astonishing. Carbon dioxide and methane, the greenhouse gases, remarkably go through exactly the same oscillations. Uh, the difference between carbon dioxide and climate, as you can see, is relatively small. The ice core record shows that changes in the level of greenhouse gases have been intimately related to changes in the climate for at least half a million years. But what causes the level of carbon dioxide to rise and fall so dramatically? For Peter Cox, the answer is clear. Well, because there, this is a period um, long before we started to emit from fossil fuels, these have to be natural changes in the carbon cycle. So what you're really looking at here is carbon moving in and out of natural stores in the Earth system. So if there's more carbon in the atmosphere, it implies there was less carbon in, in the ocean or the land or both. So what we're really seeing here is a natural tendency for carbon to shift from these various stores. Natural processes such as the growth of the Amazon don't just store huge quantities of carbon, they also release it. What's more, they can do so very quickly.
we also see in these ice cores some really astounding climate changes. Uh, we see temperature increases of 20 degrees centigrade in less than a human lifetime. And we see that occurring many times in the past. It tells us that there are sensitive spots in our climate system. And, and when we pass one of those sensitive spots, one of those thresholds, that we can expect some really huge climate changes in very short periods of time. During the ice ages, the level of CO2 oscillated between 170 and 280 parts per million as carbon moved in and out of natural stores. Today, levels stand at 370. So far, natural stores of carbon have been growing, helping to slow global warming. But as temperatures rise, are we about to cross a threshold where these stores would start to release? To try to find out, Peter Cox has taken a bold step. He has attempted for the first time to include natural carbon stores in a model of the Earth's climate. What we've done is to try to model how the ocean and the land take up carbon as climate changes. And what we find is quite shocking. It suggests that in a sense we've been a little complacent and that it's quite possible that climate change could be much faster than previously thought. In Peter's model, there's one huge natural store of carbon where the changes are particularly dramatic, the Amazon Basin. Manaus, on the banks of the Amazon River. The climate modeler has come to meet the rainforest biologist. Antonio Nobre has grown up with the forest. Peter has simulated it in his computer, but he has never actually been there. So Peter, how do how you feel about the forest? I mean, oh, it, just it, seems, it just seems lovely. Do you feel threatened by it? I no, mean, not at all. So Have you seen that it? stupid movie Anaconda? I did see it, yeah. It was <laughs> Does it look like an anaconda will jump on you right out of the forest? Not and, really, and no. It doesn't feel at all for it. It doesn't, right? Which is the impression you're given by those sort of movies. And yeah, and, and nature is a kind of a dangerous thing. Exactly, and this is very damaging because uh, people get this in their minds and when they come here with chainsaws, they yeah. want to get rid of the danger. Do yeah. you see me with wearing your sandals? Yeah. What do you very think bold. about that? That's very bold, I think. <laughs> I've been doing that for 17 years. Right. And uh, I tell you, I have never been bitten. And uh, you know why I do it? No. Because I love the forest. When you love someone and you make love to someone, you want to do it without clothing, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to completely naked, are you? <laughs> no. I, I, but I, I keep my feet sort of bare so that I can feel the leaves touching on my body. Well, we and Antonio and believes he has found the missing sink. He has measured the Amazon rainforest, soaking up a significant proportion of all the carbon dioxide we are emitting, helping to mitigate global warming. But Peter has got some disturbing news for Antonio. So what we do is we try to model the natural carbon cycle and the amount of our emissions that are taken up by, mm -hmm. by, the, by the land, vegetation, soil and by the ocean. Mm -hmm. And when we did that, what we found was that the previous assumptions were probably in error and that you could get quite a big acceleration of the rate at which climate would change. Mm -hmm. Today, the rainforest is absorbing carbon because the growth of trees is outstripping the rate at which dead trees decay. But occasionally, there is an unusually dry year, and many trees die. Measurements suggest that in these dry years, the forest can temporarily give out more carbon dioxide than it takes in. That's because growth is suppressed because you haven't got enough water. Mm -hmm. But decay from the soil, which returns carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, carries on apace. So for a while, the, uh, the decay beats the growth and you get carbon released to the atmosphere. What we find in the climate model is that that happens in the future permanent as a permanent state. So the warming of the sea surface leads to a drying of Amazonia. Okay, so the Amazon is the only place uh, where you have really a, a deep, a quick change in... As the climate warms, 
so weather patterns in the Pacific are changing. This is predicted to mean less rainfall in the Amazon basin. In Peter's model, this turns the forest from something that slows the rate of climate change into something that accelerates it. At the moment, the system's buffering us from the effect of our emissions to some extent. But in the Amazon, although that happens for a while, it's, a, it's predicted to be a sink by the model now. Mm -hmm. uh, in the f near future, it would, would become a source, if the model's right, because of this drying in the region. And die back. And die back, because once you, once you dry the system, you can't actually support all of this diversity. Okay. Um, now, in the lower one, you can see the, the, the global response, which is that there's actually quite a significant flip at about 2050. Mm -hmm. According to Peter, around 2050, the climate will cross a critical threshold. The Amazon will begin to die and release its huge accumulated store of carbon back into the atmosphere. By 2100, CO2 will have reached a level of 1,000 parts per million, nearly three times today's level. Assuming, assuming that the rainforest is totally, you know, sitting duck here, waiting for the climate to, oh, to, no. to harm it. Right, I, I, uh, I agree that that's not the case, and the model doesn't have that either. The point is, have you been able to capture the fact that the forest has an ability to hold on and to interfere with climate somehow? Yes, to some extent, uh, although whether we've done, whether it's as robust as it should be is, is an open question still. But beyond the edge of the forest, in the savannah, Peter met Carlos Nobre, head of the Institute for the Study of the Amazon. Carlos believes that the Amazon is indeed vulnerable to a small shift in rainfall. What's more, the climate flip could be even more abrupt than Peter's model suggests. There's such a massive contrast to the forest, this landscape. It's a small difference in the length of the rainy season, of the dry season. Four months, dry season, forest six months savanna. You see one very important fact to be known is that the rainfall here and in the drier parts of the forest, eastern Amazon, it's about the same annually. It's 1.5 meters. So the question is why we have such a different landscape, why we have the savanna type of vegetation and uh, you know, a lush tropical forest. That's the length of the dry season. That makes all of the difference. The short dry season in Amazonia means that the forest never has a chance to dry out properly. It remains damp all year round. But if the dry season were just a few weeks longer, like the savannah, the forest would become dry as tinder, and that would make it vulnerable to its deadliest enemy. Uh, a savannah naturally burns twice in a decade. Oh. And that's what keeps it from becoming a forest, I suppose? Yes, absolutely. When the soil becomes very dry, then the forest becomes dry and flammable. So uh, fire becomes a risk. If the forest becomes too dry during the dry season, then fire might happen. And the fire really kills most of the forest species. And then in that area, we might see savanna. Of course, the savanna vegetation as a whole has much less carbon in its stock. The forest has perhaps five to ten times more carbon in its stock. So the end result would be a pulse of carbon into the atmosphere when the forest is replaced by the savanna. This is now the year 2050. Man-made climate change has lengthened the dry season to the point where the Amazon rainforest is burning uncontrollably. Suddenly, carbon the forest has been soaking up for hundreds of years is released back into the atmosphere. By 2100, land temperatures will rise by eight degrees. And 
this is only the beginning. The stage has been set for a further unstoppable acceleration of climate change. For the oceans now begin to warm. Beneath them there is a far more massive store of carbon ready to escape into the atmosphere. 55 million years ago it did just that and the effect was a global catastrophe. These are the badlands of Wyoming, a desolate area of ancient eroded sediments. It's a place that draws geologists from across the globe. Well, the place was first found in 1912, and we found the place again in 1976 as part of a general survey of the whole broad northern end of this basin. They come to examine these strange red, orange and purple bands. They were laid down at the dawn of the world as we know it, at the boundary between the Paleocene and Eocene epochs of Earth history. A time after the extinction of the dinosaurs, when familiar mammals such as horses and our own ancestors, the primates, first appeared. 55 million years ago, this area of northwestern Wyoming would have been much like the western Amazon basin is today. It was tropical rainforest, fed by rivers which were coming down from the Rocky Mountains as they were uplifted. And these rivers brought down tons of sediment from the newly formed mountains. Washed down with that sediment were the remains of early mammals such as the first horses. For 25 years I've been trying to figure out where horses came from. Paleontologist Philip Gingerich came here to look for fossil mammals. What he found was evidence of a sudden upheaval in the climate, an event which disrupted the evolution of life across the globe. Well, in the process of looking for the first horses, we narrowed down the occurrence of them to one thin band, and we called that the boundary sandstone, be between what was here before and what came after. And then, to our surprise, within the boundary sand we found red beds and purple beds, and just within that, the fauna had horses in it, but was different. And many of the species were smaller than we expected based on what was here before and what came after. I've got one right here. So, here's what the jaw looks like, here's what the lower leg looks like, and then you add that on to the upper leg, and for a horse that's not, that's not very big really. In mammals sometimes they get bigger, sometimes they get smaller, but I had never before seen a time a narrow band like this where they were sharply offset. So if this is the normal size, suddenly you get smaller ones that hardly overlap with the size range what you had before, and then they jump right back again. And that's very distinctive and very puzzling. It was a mystery. What had caused the shrinking mammals and the strange red beds? For 20 years, no one knew the answer until scientists began to look beneath the sea. This ship is a time machine. It drills into the sea floor to extract sediment which has been slowly building up for millions of years. These sediment cores will take their place in a vast library. Here is a unique record of atmosphere and climate, where the Vostok ice cores stretch back hundreds of thousands of years. This place can take scientists back hundreds of millions. 
In 1999, a young PhD student called Santo Baines came here in search of clues to what happened 55 million years ago. He was looking for one core in particular. Okay, we're going for 690. I wanted, yeah. Of all the cores ever drilled, Core 690 was reputed to have the most detailed record of the Paleocene-Eocene climate change event. Two sections above and two sections below to try and get the whole event. I was supposed to be doing a project that uh, concentrated mainly on uh, climate change over the entire of the Paleocene epoch, which is about 10 million years long. But uh, I had read various papers that had discussed the Paleocene-Eocene boundary, where there is a massive climate change episode. So while I was here, I made sure that I looked at the Paleocene-Eocene boundary cores in particular detail and took a lot of samples from these cores. This point here where you can see the dramatic color change is actually the Paleocene-Eocene boundary. Uh, this is where the rapid climate change uh, begins. And as you can see, it, it happens uh, instantaneously in, in the geological core. This Paleocene-Eocene boundary record, although quite complete, is quite condensed. But we have other cores, this core in particular, core 690, which was drilled off the coast of Antarctica, contains a Paleocene-Eocene boundary sequence, which is about five times as spread out. So it gives us a chance to look in really high detail at the climate change episode. Santo took a sample of sediment every centimetre along Core 690. Buried in the ooze at the bottom of the sea are the remains of tiny shelly sea creatures, the foraminifera, or forams for short. They had survived the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, but 55 million years ago, half the deep water forams suddenly became extinct. Locked up in their shells are clues to what killed them. These shells were made from carbon dioxide dissolved in the sea, and their detailed composition reflects the temperature of the water and the level of CO2 in the atmosphere. Right now, I'm picking out different species of foraminifera to run on the mass spectrometer down in the lab. The good thing about picking out different species is that when you analyze them chemically, because they lived at different water depths, it'll give you some idea of what was happening throughout the entire water column. And so, if you see a surface temperature rise in the ocean, you can look to see whether that has penetrated to the deep waters as well. In an Oxford laboratory, Santo dropped the tiny forams into acid, releasing carbon dioxide that had last seen the atmosphere. 55 million years ago. Santo's analysis confirmed that when the mammals had shrunk, atmospheric carbon levels had suddenly risen sharply, causing a rapid warming of ocean waters. But as he examined more and more samples, something extraordinary emerged. There was not just one sudden rise in carbon and temperature, there were three. Temperatures increased dramatically in a stepped way over only a few hundred years. Uh, this is something that nobody has ever seen in the geological record before. We're seeing three instantaneous increases in temperature of a few degrees, uh, totaling up to a total increase of about uh, eight degrees Celsius or so, um, which is just something nobody expected to see uh, from a time interval when the Earth was already about five to seven degrees warmer than it is today. The rise in atmospheric carbon was just as dramatic. The jumps in the graph add up to one and a half trillion tons of it. Where had all this carbon come from? Well, the only explanation to date that can really uh, give an answer to this dramatic climate change and carbon dioxide change is that methane hydrates, which are substances in the seafloor, decomposed 
and bled very light carbon into the oceans and into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide and methane. Methane hydrates are a huge store of carbon. They form on the seafloor from rotting organic matter washed down the world's rivers. If you imagine the Amazon rainforest, where does all that stuff go? Um, eventually, a lot of the organic matter goes down the Amazon River in with the sediment and winds up as a great big pile in the Amazon Delta out to sea. And it keeps on decaying there, the bacteria get at it, and turn quite a lot of it into methane. Then, if the pressure on the seafloor is high enough or the temperature low enough, this methane mixes with water to form frozen deposits which can contain large amounts of the gas. A classical methane hydrate is, is a bit like an ice that's got lots of methane in it. And if you held it in your hand, it would be very fizzy, give off lots of methane. When the ice melts, 170 times its volume of methane comes bubbling out. What's more, methane's warming effect is much greater than carbon dioxide's. Weight for weight, it, it's nearly 60 times more powerful. Methane also has a, quite a short lifetime, um, round about a decade. And that means that if you emit methane into the air, it has this powerful warming effect for this short period. Then it's converted into carbon dioxide. The trouble is, the methane only remains locked up if the pressure at the seafloor stays high and the temperature stays low. If conditions change, it will quickly escape. They are stabilized really by the pressure and the local temperature environment. And if you change that, they will become unstable. Methane hydrates are essentially unstable. Fifty-five million years ago, the world's oceans were slowly warming, just as they are today. We have evidence that from the middle of the Paleocene into the early Eocene, there was a slow warming trend for the entire globe. And it's possible that the oceans warmed to some sort of threshold temperature that allowed the release of methane hydrates from the sea floor. We don't just see one large release of methane hydrates what we actually see is that they were released in three distinct episodes. And this suggests that one methane hydrate accumulation decomposed, bled carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which caused severe global warming. And this global warming rapidly caused the oceans to warm even more which then caused further methane hydrate accumulations to decompose. So it was, if you like, a, a runaway greenhouse event. Could a similar runaway catastrophe lie in wait for us, or our children? This happened at least three times at the Paleocene-Eocene boundary, and methane hydrates are available in the ocean today, which is frightening because it means that such an event could potentially happen again. If the ocean water were to warm, um, you could destabilize hydrate, particularly in the Arctic. Now, in the Arctic, the hydrate is stabilized more by the very low temperatures, so it's shallower. Um, but because the temperatures are so low, the permafrost um, can host hydrate. Now, if you were to warm that and the permafrost decayed, um, then you'd get release of that hydrate, and also you'd get release of any gas that was under, below the hydrate. But this is not the future. Arctic waters have already started to warm. Already there are signs that methane hydrates are decomposing. This satellite image is thought to show a small plume of methane escaping from beneath the Arctic Ocean. If Peter Cox's model is right, by the end of the century with the Amazon rainforest gone, 
and its billions of tons of carbon in the atmosphere, temperatures around the Arctic Ocean could be eight degrees higher. Under such conditions, it is hard to see how massive releases of methane could possibly be avoided. Such events would dwarf this accidental release when a small deposit was disturbed by drilling. 55 million years ago, spontaneous releases of carbon took global temperatures to a level perhaps 15 degrees higher than human beings have ever experienced. If those events were to be repeated, we do not know what of the world around us could survive such extreme conditions. Yet within 50 years, we could unwittingly have set in train a series of events which would make such a dangerous rise in temperatures inevitable. By then, even if we could stop burning fossil fuels, it would be too late. Huge natural forces would have taken control of the climate. Eventually, as happened 55 million years ago, those forces would return things to normal. But that took 60,000 years. What we're finding really in the model is that there's a, there is a critical threshold, and I'm fairly sure that exists, uh, where the natural uh, biosphere stops buffering us from the effects of our emissions and actually starts to amplify them. So you really want to avoid that because suddenly then climate change occurs much more rapidly. It's not far-fetched. The way they explain to me, I start to believe it's possible that we will have a massive crash of the system. We have all the elements here for that to happen. Uh, like a body that is being abused too much, it dies. Uh, that could happen here, I think. How does that make you feel? Doomsday? <laughs> I think uh, if there is an, uh, a spacecraft to Mars, I probably <laughs> will be one of the passengers. <laughs> this is going to, be, to become a really nasty place to live without the forest. Uh, desert, isn't it? If we lose this green, it's really an incredible loss. Uh, it's a disaster, really. Well, I prefer to see our results more of a warning than a prediction because they're not inevitable. I mean, they rely on the assumption that we won't do anything about uh, emitting carbon dioxide. If we can do something, if we can prevent carbon dioxide levels getting to dangerous levels, then we can also prevent loss of the forest here. And loss of the forest here would mean um, effects on climate globally. Um, a rapid change in climate. So there's a good reason to believe that the research itself might help to uh, provide some leverage to do that. And that's the hope really, is that we can make a change, prevent that happening. Details of next week's programme in a moment, and Equinox, the book of science, containing all four Equinox books in one volume, is out now priced at $12.99. And you can order from the Channel 4 shop with free delivery on 0870 1234 344, or click on to channel4.com forward slash shop. Well, next up all, gay, straight or just confused, Kevin Klein has a big dilemma in the film comedy In and Out. <laughs>